Good afternoon, I'm Mindy Wright, a member of the CMC Board of Trust Trustees, and I'm also an Assistant Vice Provost at Ohio State. I'm glad to welcome you all today. Today's forum, Contemporary Politics, the Day After New Hampshire, is brought to us by Hannah News Service and the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation. They are each represented here by many of their associates, so let's give them a hand for helping them make this forum possible. Now that we have the results from New Hampshire and the race for president of the United States is maybe just a little bit clearer, or maybe it's not, um, <clears throat> one thing we know for sure is that we can look forward to more political commercials as we move towards Ohio's primary and the general election later in November. In the meantime, we have many candidates and issues to consider. We look to our expert panel today to provide some insight into what we might expect. So please welcome columnist and assistant professor at Ohio University, Thomas Suttis, director of the Ray Bliss Institute of Applied Politics at the University of Akron, John Green, and our host and moderator, who will also participate in the conversation, Emeritus Professor of Political Science at The Ohio State University, Herb Asher. Herb, the floor is yours. So yesterday was Mardi Gras and the New Hampshire primary. <laughs> and today there are a lot of people in New Orleans with hangovers, but there are also a lot of people at the Democratic National Committee and the Republican National Committee who have hangovers. Uh, so it, it's, it's a fascinating time. And let me just start by talking a little bit about some fantasies. Now, one prospective fantasy that every political scientist and journalist would just absolutely love would be a brokered convention. And uh, we haven't seen that in a long, long time. And nothing that happened yesterday reduces the likelihood of a brokered convention and might have actually increased the odds by just a little bit. But there'll be political scientists and journalists who could fashion an entire career on one brokered convention. And if both parties had a brokered convention, that would be, that would be just a gift. But thinking about, <laughs> thinking about retrospective fantasies, not that any of us would have ever done this and taken advantage of Las Vegas, but imagine if we could go back one year in time, but with the knowledge we have today, and go to some betting establishments in Las Vegas and say, I'd like to place a bet of, let's say, $1,000, $2,000, $5,000 on the following. Uh, I want to bet that Donald Trump will win the New Hampshire primary on the Republican side and Bernie Sanders on the Democratic <laughs> side. And what kind of odds would you give me? Ask the better. Uh, and if the better said, well, gee, I don't know. Well, I'll add to that that they're going to win by double digits. It won't even be close. And I assume that we could have gotten unbelievably fantastic odds. We would all then currently have our condos in Florida and not be putting up with this weather out here. Uh, so one of the things to really talk about is uh, how did we get to where we are today? All of us have some thoughts about that. All of us have some thoughts about what does New Hampshire actually mean? Uh, I think we all, I think all the pundits have said, well, this means it's going to be a longer nomination battle. And of course, if that's the case, the happiest people in the United States are the owners of the local television stations in primary and caucus states who will in fact be the big beneficiaries. But why don't we just start about with really talking about, you know, how, how did we get where we are and what does New Hampshire mean for the future? And John, why don't you? Well, you know, we've had months and months of speculation about what would happen yesterday. Uh, and uh, it was actually very rewarding to actually have people vote. Um, and so we, you know, we don't just have to depend upon, upon the polls. But in, uh, in New Hampshire yesterday, uh, the polls were, were basically accurate. Uh, in fact, uh, both on the Republican side and the Democratic side, the winners actually outperformed the uh, average poll predictions, which was really pretty interesting because if you look back at Iowa, the assumption was that the polls would, would not be very accurate 
And partly that has to do with the nature of a caucus state versus a primary state. But as many of you may know, in, in um, New Hampshire, independents can choose which party they want to vote in. So that's part of the unpredictable uh, nature of that, uh, of that state. But I, I think it does set up a, a longer uh, primary than we might have otherwise had, a longer season, really, really for two reasons. On the Democratic side, we have a strong ideological division between Senator Sanders and Secretary Clinton. That we've seen that before in Democratic primaries, and that can run through states like Ohio. On the Republican side, though, we have a, an insurgent candidate, an unusual candidate, which no doubt we'll talk about, in Donald Trump. But if you look at the potential opponents to Trump, I'm not sure that yesterday really settled anything. Of course, those of us in Ohio, many of us were pleased to see uh, Governor Kasich uh, finish in the mix. But there's not that much difference between Kasich's results and Bush and Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz. Uh, so you, you could imagine their campaign advisors saying today, wow, we've got a chance. We've got to keep this thing going in the next several uh, primaries. So I, I think what happened yesterday does mean that we'll have a, at least a few more highly contested races. We should all keep in mind, first of all, that New Hampshire is not a typical state in many, many ways. I work there, and about the statistics don't lie about how different it is from United States as a whole, demographically. But I think the largest story of yesterday's primary in New Hampshire, and maybe what's going to happen in a couple days in other places, is that I think people in general, and I know this is a cliche, but I think it's real this time, are tired of the status quo, what they perceive to be the status quo. Um, ultimately, people are media consumers, and they've gotten more sophisticated about it. And when they see a packaged or canned message, they tend to recognize it. They may not be able to pick it apart, but they understand it. And so in that respect, what Trump is doing is a new way of positioning a product for something in a new way people haven't seen in a long, long time. There's also a long time tradition in American politics of insurgency at times of social dislocation or social stagnation, or economic stagnation, which we have. I'm more on that in a moment. I think we need to keep something else in mind. And again, I'm not the political scientist. These guys are the scholars. I'm just the, the sideline critic of uh, what happens. Um, but I think we need to keep in mind that Fundamentally, you could argue in presentation terms that John Kasich is a kind of insurgent because his unique selling proposition is, I'm not like these other, and except for Ms. Fiorina, these guys. I mean, I'm going door to door, I'm doing this, I'm talking about American values, I'm talking about, I'm, I can add from some country kitchen type environment, restaurant or something. I'm not making fun of him, I'm saying that comes across as more authentic than something that's super packaged. Whether it's authentic or not is for anyone else to decide. The third thing I want to mention to everybody is that I think it would be salutary if many of us spent some time outside, this sounds like a cliche too, outside Columbus, and saw that yes, we have record low unemployment and many, many ways economic indicators for all kinds of macro measures are very good. But for the average person in the average American household or the average American location, he or she is not doing significantly better and maybe has fallen behind. I think the frustration that engenders has led to some of the results we saw yesterday. Uh, let me comment a little bit on Governor Kasich and also Governor Christie. And I think you probably heard a number of commentators last night talk about Governor Christie as perhaps single-handedly having changed some of the dynamics of New Hampshire. And of course, that was a reference to uh, the cross-examination that Christie did of Rubio. I personally believe that uh, Governor Christie performed a public service uh, that evening. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I don't, have any, I don't have any preferences here. But, uh, uh, but one of the things that is exciting about the Kasich campaign, and it's not just the values. It, 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 it's really uh, maybe people will learn more about him. I've been saying that among the 17 Republicans running for president, uh, he was the most qualified. And by that I meant he not only had an important set of experiences in the Congress at the national level as an executive, I think it's very important to have executive experience, and then in business. So he had those experiences. And by and large, it's, it's, it's fine to have an experience, but if you don't perform well, but he's performed well in those experiences. He's learned things from those experiences. So that's really another asset. And then he was the only Republican, by and large, who did not fall prey to the politics of fear. 
to the politics of attacking everybody else and who said such radical things as we're all going to have to work together. We're going to actually have to reach across the line. And he actually was talking about governing. And one of the things that oftentimes frustrates us, in, 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 in those of us who study the American political system, is that oftentimes you can get rewarded for running good campaigns, but the people who run good campaigns may not, in fact, be people who know how to govern well. So at, at least the fact that Governor Kasich has been talking about governing, some people last night said it sounded like he's running a general election campaign. And I was saying, no, no, what he's talking about is really what's central. How do we accomplish things in this country? And it, it's, I mean, I think Tom is right. There is so much anger and frustration, and we need to understand that better. But at some point, you've got to channel and do some constructive things. And I thought, actually, uh, Governor Kasich really added quite a bit to the conversation, even though the media were late, and are still somewhat late, in recognizing that he actually is in his own single lane. They've been lumping him together with all of the other mainstream candidates. But there's another way to separate him from all the other Republicans. And then the challenge becomes, how will that message play in South Carolina? How will that message play in other states? But I assume that in every state, there's probably, I don't mean this as a, a slam or whatever, but there must be 10, 15, 20%, 25% of the GOP electorate that would say, wait a second, this is a different voice than everything else we're hearing from Trump and Cruz and Rubio, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Well, you know, it, it, we, Governor Kasich's strategy was apparently to do well in New Hampshire. And that's a time-honored way uh, to win a, a presidential nomination. And he basically accomplished that. Um, you know, I was asked by a number of reporters yesterday what I, where I thought he would come in. And I thought he might have a, a real close third or maybe be you know, fourth, but by just by a little smidgen. So uh, I was quite impressed when he came in second, even though he was double digits behind the winner of the primary. And just to give you an example of what that means, that means an extraordinary amount of attention will be focused on him around the country. And some of the neglect that Herb mentioned, I think, will be taken care of. One very small indication of that, I noticed last night in the middle of the night on, on CNN that uh, CNN had posted a little a bit of information about how to pronounce the name of the governor of Ohio. <laughs> now, if people can't pronounce your name, they may not vote for you. So there's an example of the kind of impact New Hampshire can have for a candidate. That's a very good point. That was something that the late Bern Reif always thought about when running statewide. People wouldn't be able to pronounce his surname in Northeast Ohio, although we'd be better up there than some other parts of the state with different surnames. Uh, one thing I thought was interesting, uh, looking at a list of towns in New Hampshire, which are, we might call townships, but the county doesn't really mean much up there except as an administrative unit uh, for courts. The, um, he didn't, Kasich didn't carry that many towns, but the, he carried two that I thought were really interesting to see of the half dozen or maybe 80 carried. One of them was Hanover, which is Dartmouth. Uh, the other is Orford. Uh, Orford you wouldn't know about, except that Orford was the longtime home of the most conservative governor New Hampshire's had probably in the last 90 years, a guy named Mel Thompson, who was governor in the 90s or the 70s, whose main claim, main claim to fame was fighting all those kook anti-nuclear people at Seabrook at the nuclear plant. Uh, and he was probably William Loeb's idea of a great governor for New Hampshire. Dartmouth, I mentioned, in Hanover, because um, that environment's been a, a seedbed for a lot of people in the Republican National Commentariat. If you look at some people that work at the Weekly Standard or work in the various blog sites and so forth, they come out of either uh, Dartmouth itself or out of something called the, um, the, news, the alternative newspaper for conservative people at, uh, at uh, Dartmouth, the Dartmouth Review. And I think that was interesting to see kind of a broad spectrum. Again, it's not scientific. Not everyone in Orford is like Mel Thompson. But to see what amounted to a kind of a broad spectrum appeal in a state that has kind of polarized Republican politics, I thought was interesting. John, let me, let me ask you, John, can Trump win the, Demo the Republican nomination? And what, what are the possibilities of a broker convention? And then I'll ask Tom the same question about Bernie Sanders and the possibility of a broker Democratic convention. Well, I do think that Donald Trump can win the Republican nomination. 
Now I have to have a pause. I've actually said that. Um, um, Here comes the lightning bolt. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but that's because all kinds of strange things happen in, in presidential politics. Um, I think he, has, he is speaking for a group of people in the Republican Party that feel very frustrated, as, as Tom mentioned, not just frustrated with the economic situation in their lives, which is, in many cases, very disappointing to them, sometimes even grim. If you think about the change in jobs we've had over the last 20 years uh, all across the country, but also people who are deeply frustrated with party politics. And in the exit polls last night, we saw some examples of that. Republican primary voters in New Hampshire were especially frustrated with their party. We saw some of that on the Democratic side, but not quite uh, to the same extent. Part of the rise of Donald Trump, if you will, is that the so-called Republican establishment, the sort of traditional leaders of the Republican Party did not have a champion, or rather they had a champion who didn't do very well, and that's Jeb Bush. Remember last summer, many of us were talking about Bush and Clinton fatigue and what a boring election 2016 would be because we'd <laughs> just have a rerun of the, uh, some past elections. Well, that didn't happen. So, you know, if you take the votes that John Kasich and Marco Rubio, Jeb Bush, and Chris Christie got and add them up, it's about 45% of the vote which would be roughly 9 to 10% more than Trump got. So th there are a lot of Republicans who are not ready to support Donald Trump. And so the question becomes, over the next several primaries, can they find a champion? Can they find someone they can unite behind? And it, it's quite possible that they won't. And that gives Mr. Trump an opening. But it's also possible that he won't get a majority either. And that's where the brokered uh, convention. And as Herb's absolutely right, our colleagues in political science and in uh, journalism are salivating over the prospect of a brokered convention of all places, Cleveland. Wow, yeah. that would really be fun. A city that's the home of political brokerage in more ways than one. Um, on the Democratic side, I think there are a couple of interesting factors here, one of which is I think it will, I, I, I do find it hard to believe that Senator Sanders is going to do particularly well in some Southern Democratic primaries. I just do, and that's not a slam. I just. I worked in Mississippi as well, and I know this region a little bit. But it, with Democratic victories of nominations come down to assembling a coalition of several elements, one of which is labor, public employee unions now more than ever, uh, African-American voters now more than ever, and of course, women who are particularly attuned to the disjunction between opportunities and real existing circumstances economically for women in the workplace and women in the professions. Um, I, I thought it was interesting coming up in the, my perilous drive up U.S. 33. Um, that uh, well, thanks, ODOT. Anyway, um, <laughs> the, uh, I shouldn't say it. only one part of the road was that way. And for, in all honesty, that uh, Ms. Governor Sa Mr. Sanders is meeting I think today or tomorrow with uh, Reverend Mr. Al Sharpton, uh, having a breakfast meeting or a lunch meeting or something, which is a kind of another way of. Seeing what's out there coalition-wise, one last thing about that. The last time Democrats really did nominate a kind of ideological conscience Democrat was in 1972 when George McGovern was nominated. I think he was a fine man, but obviously he didn't do very well at the polls. And so I still suspect that Senator and Secretary Clinton is in long-term pretty good shape. But on the other hand, there's some fatigue there, yes. Well, there's been a lot of speculation about what Mayor Bloomberg might do. And, uh, and Michael Bloomberg has sort of said that, well, I'm waiting to see what happens, and that if, for example, it were Trump versus Sanders, or I assume also Cruz versus Sanders, uh, that he'd be tempted to run. And some of us were joking that if it were Trump versus Sanders with, uh, with uh, Bloomberg getting in, this would be the ultimate New York conspiracy. Uh, I mean, think of all, you know, uh, Trump, New York developer, Sanders, Brooklyn. Yeah, I mean, just the, you know, it would just be great. And the rest of the country would feel, how did, how did the New Yorkers do this to us? That, how did this happen or whatever? But, but uh, can we talk a little bit about what are the real challenges to actually having Bloomberg get into the race and being successful? And if you really have, let me just give you two choices or two scenarios. Let's say it's Cruz versus Sanders or it's Trump versus Sanders. What's the impact of Bloomberg in a contest like that? Who does he help? Well, you know, it's a really interesting question. And let me preface it by saying that 
it's, it's actually very hard to get on the ballot as an independent or minor party candidate. So at the point when uh, Mayor, Bloom, if Mayor Bloomberg decided to run, he would have to put together an organization in all of the states, and there'd have to be an awful lot of work. Uh, and uh, his friends on the Democratic and Republican side would do everything possible to make his job more difficult. In some cases, his petition drives. There, there are other ways there'll be lawsuits. Now, if there's anybody in America that has the money to do that, it's Michael Bloomberg, so it can actually be accomplished, yeah. but it would, there'd be an awful lot of, of, of work to, that, to do that. And the reason I mention that is it, he doesn't have to be on all the states to be elected president, right? There, he just has to be in enough states that if he won them, he could um, win the electoral college. But that would have an impact on who he would hurt or help. In, um, in more uh, East Coast and West Coast states, I suspect he would take votes more from the Republican candidate because there would be a very strong support for Democrats in those states. But I think in a, in a state like Ohio, he might take from the Democratic side uh, more than, than other places. Um, it, it's very hard to be elected as a minor party candidate. In fact, it's never happened. <laughs> but um, one thing we do know about strong independent runs is that they often determine which of the major party candidates wins. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so in that sense, having uh, Bloomberg in the race would make the election much less predictable than it might otherwise be. Tom, do you want to weigh in? I disagree with John basically about the whole thing. I, th I think that third party candidate, though ultimately, or a third candidate may, would probably benefit Democrats in the long run this year. Uh, who do you think the Democratic candidate and the Democratic Party and the Democratic National Committee would most want to run against and I, and I hear I'd say both Bernie and Hillary, would they want to run against Donald, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, John Kasich? Who's the candidate that they really want to have as their opponent? Do you think there's any consensus there? Uh, you know, what I hear from uh, my Democratic friends is the candidate that they would really like to run against is Ted Cruz, because they feel that Senator Cruz stands on a whole variety of issues, potentially divide the Republican coalition, uh, and so th they think that's interesting. But, but many of them are also very uh, eager to run against Donald Trump, except the guy's so unpredictable, right? <laughs> and, and so, you know, some of my friends say, well, you know, we'd run against him this way, but wait a minute. Some people tried that last November, and it didn't work very well. You know, it seems like every week we learn something new about uh, Donald Trump. Uh, one of the things we learned about him uh, last week was that he can handle adversity. He, he didn't come in first in Iowa. Lots of candidates who've not been through the electoral process crumble when they have a big disappointment. But we also learned that he knew the motto of the state of New Hampshire. He apparently thought they had developed it last week. <laughs> so he said, New Hampshire, good job. Even my students realized that that was a bit of an overstatement. So, you know, th there, there were Democrats, I think, who would like to run against Trump, but he is so unusual that, that there's a little bit of, of reservation there. Um, you know, I don't, I, I think some of them would like to run against Rubio because they feel that he's untested. Um, some of them would like to run against Bush because of, you know, the Bush fatigue. Um, and of course, they're terrified of John Kasich, right? <laughs> I think that uh, I, I think that uh, I think that Donald Trump is, is unpredictable. He's kind of a, a reshape forming person every time you turn around. And I don't mean this as a, a personal sarcastic remark, but essentially he has no, as far as I can ascertain, no philosophical principles or framework, which is to say he can't be held accountable for much. He says because every day is a new day in Trump land <laughs> about things. Um, I think that Senator Cruz would probably be the the, the candidate Democrats would most uh, like to have against, uh, run against. I think that, if, assuming this has been reported, and I assume it's accurate, that not one single U.S. senator has endorsed Senator Cruz for the presidency because he is so widely and avidly disliked by his colleagues in the Senate, which I believe for other reasons to be the case. Um, that says something about someone's vulnerabilities. Um, I also, I actually do think that in some level his citizenship question does come into play. I'm not saying it should or shouldn't. I think it could come into play as a political soapbox item. You know, a lot of us have been talking about when would the Trump 
candidacy collapse of its own weight. You know, how many vulgar statements could you make? And, uh, and we realized that, in fact, there are different rules for different candidates or whatever. And, uh, and for a long time, uh, I was not getting on board saying, oh, Trump's going to disappear. Uh, and I said, He's, he has staying power. And then a, about a week before the Paris attacks, I made a prediction about both Trump and Carson. And I said, this is the beginning of the end for them. And of course, I was right about Carson and entirely wrong about Trump. And I think the Paris attacks really helped him in ways that uh, may not be as obvious. But, and let me, let me just elaborate a little bit. But I've been so frustrated at times that the President of the United States ha is tone deaf on certain things. And I'm not saying he's the cause of, uh, of Donald Trump, but when, in fact, you have Americans who now are afraid, don't, don't worry about whether their fears are rational or irrational, and don't dismiss them as being irrational. That's very insulting to people. Uh, you really had a situation where you know, the president, and in many cases he was misquoted, but referred to ISIS as the JV team. ISIS was contained. I'm sorry, he never said ISIS. It was always ISIL. <laughs> Mr. President, if the American people hear the term ISIS, why don't you use the term ISIS? And, and there was really this sort of this attitude, well, don't worry about Syrian immigrants coming in. We screen them very well. There's no chance of uh, terrorists sneaking in. And everybody would know, well, don't say there's no chance. Why are you dismissing legitimate concerns? <clears throat> Haven't you ever heard the term empathy? Haven't you ever heard the term, you know, I don't call it whether you want to call it pandering, we're just, just letting Americans know, I understand why you're concerned. And darned if Donald Trump doesn't go all the way the other way and do actually a wonderful job of appealing to our worst instincts. And that's kind of frustrating. And it'll be interesting to see now whether as things go along, does Donald Trump become a little bit more respectable, uh, not mainstream, because I think you're generally correct. I mean, he has no filters, and he's not constrained. And he gets away with things that no other candidate can get away with. So it's an interesting. Now, we're getting close to the point where we're going to start getting ready for your questions, but we want to talk a little bit about some of the things that are going on in Ohio. And, uh, and uh, we assume Ohio will be a key battleground state, so that'll be wonderful. We'll see all these wonderful ads. We'll have all these presidential visits. The primary will be exciting. It, 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 you know, it'll be like 2012 all over again, ideally. But, but we also could have some interesting ballot issues, and we have a very important United States Senate race. So uh, anybody want to comment either on ballot, potential ballot issues or the U.S. Senate race? Well, let me talk about the U.S. Senate race. Of course, we have Senator Portman, the Republican senator from Ohio, who's up for re-election. Uh, most people who know Rob Portman personally like him and admire him. Uh, but you know, he has not polled very well for the last year. And part of that is some of the dissension in his own party. Um, part of it is that, uh, interestingly enough, a lot of Ohioans don't know a lot about him, even though I think you can objectively point to a pretty good record. Um, and you know, that has encouraged uh, Democrats who would, would very, very much uh, given some of the uh, disappointments Democrats had in uh, 2014, they very, very much like to win that seat. And if not win the seat, then at least make it very close. Of course, the Democrats have to pick a candidate to do that. And we have a really interesting dynamic between uh, former Governor Strickland, who seems to be, uh, if I can use this word, the uh, favorite of the Democratic Party establishment, and then P.G. Sittenfeld, a city council person from Cincinnati who's, who's making a lot of waves across the state. And if not um, someone who can win this time, then maybe a candidate for the future. So it's a really interesting interesting primary uh, between those, those two as to who will face Senator Portman. A year ago, some people thought that Portman might face a primary, serious primary challenge, mm -hmm. because some of the divisions in the Republican Party, and that appears that that won't happen. But nonetheless, on the Democratic side, I think a really interesting dynamic has developed. Uh, Tom, since you're down in Athens County, you know, the, the, the pot capital of Ohio. Uh, <laughs> Not true, Mex County is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, what about the prospects for 
some kind of marijuana issue on the ballot. Uh, I, I think the prospects are pretty good, but I, I think the legislature, and I think it's sincere, of taking the medical marijuana side of it um, on as a serious debate, and because I think that, uh, I don't know the science, and I don't pretend to know the science, I don't really, doesn't bother me what the science is either way, but I think many people believe that medical marijuana is, is a, um, is a uh, um, salutary relief from people's pain or from discomfort from chemotherapy and so forth, and that it should be available to people that would benefit from it. I suspect if that happens through a statute, that will kind of undercut some of the oomph behind a statewide ballot issue. Um, I want to make one point about ballot issues, and I think many, many of you would notice this. It's not easy getting on the ballot with a ballot issue as people that put ballot issues out there will bellyache about, but it's the fact that the consultants have discovered kind of an off-year recreational activity to make more money. And so we're seeing more and more ballot issues, I think, because in the years that someone's not running for senator or for president or governor, uh, you got to keep business coming in to keep the office going, and ballot issues are becoming the, um, the resort of choice, like a full employment act or a stimulus bill for <laughs> consultants. And I call it because of the unhappy experience in one of our western states with ballot issues, the Californication of Ohio. <laughs> no. Well, actually, you know, in, indeed, I think there are many people who, looking at last year's marijuana issue, that was 10 wealthy people who had the resources to collect signatures, get on the ballot, and run you know, a very effective but losing campaign. Or even more uh, relevant are the, are the casinos. Why do we have four casinos in Ohio located but where they are? Because you had wealthy casino owners yeah. who had the resources to actually get this on the ballot and actually specify in the Constitution who would own these casinos and where they would be located. I think Tom's exactly right. That's really uh, an abuse of the, the, yeah. the whole intent of the citizen initiative. But there's another possible issue that could be on the ballot that we, one way or the other, and that would actually be congressional redistricting. Wow. Uh, this past election, uh, the voters of Ohio finally you know, approved changing the way we would draw our state legislative lines. Uh, we did not put congressional redistricting on the ballot at the same time because there was an issue before the U.S. Supreme Court, and Speaker Boehner at the time had requested that we wait until that issue got resolved. The court uh, uh, de determined that independent commissions could, in fact, do congressional redistricting. So now there's a tug of war going on, and there are a lot of people out there who would now like to finish the job in terms of getting the congressional redistricting method changed, doing something very similar that we had just adopted for the state, but there are some opponents to it. And some of the opponents to congressional redistricting are actually incumbent congressmen in Ohio who love the fact that they have very, very safe districts. And who could blame them for loving those kinds of districts? But it would be nice if our elections are more meaningful. So either the legislature will probably put something on the ballot, or there'll be a citizen initiative to put something on the ballot in 2016. So we'll see. I think uh, getting very close. And, one, people maybe start lining up. If you have any questions, we want to make sure we leave enough time here. Uh, are there any? I just want to make one sure. little brief comment about redistricting. You know, there was a strong support for the uh, legislative redistricting. But when I talk to people around Ohio, the really bad examples they cite are all congressional <laughs> districts. <laughs> and I'm supposed to say here, obviously, these are questions, not statements, not speeches, whatever. <laughs> but, I, but I know I don't have to say it to Marion. <laughs> Marion Harris. My question is about gun safety issues. Um, it's come up in the uh, Senate primary situation in Ohio. It's come up uh, in the, pri the national primaries. I'd like to know what your thoughts are as to how much that will play uh, in the campaigns to come. I didn't, I didn't hear all that. Oh, uh, it's not your fault, Mary. No, no, no. Uh, how much would gun safety issues play in elections and thank primaries you, to come? A, thank you very much. I, obviously, Mr. Sittenfeld believes it's a very salient issue. That's why he's making it one of the centerpieces of his uh, of his campaign, criticizing what he says is the former Governor, Sitton, uh, former governor Strickland's um, uh, somewhat um, changeable positions or uncertain positions about firearm safety, firearms and ob obtaining. Um, I, I, what I don't know is to what extent it, it resonates with rank and file voters. I'm not saying it shouldn't. I'm not saying it should. Uh, I don't know that, though. Um, I don't know that it's as central to the concerns of people. I happen to think it's a, an important question. 
as some of the concerns of people is that a lot of other things might be like the economy, jobs, and uh, development, and to some extent economic pro or environmental protection. Um, but on the other hand, the Sittenfeld campaign certainly has been creative and smart, and so I presume that they're focusing on it because they have, have research indicating that it's a, a very powerful debating point. And it's interesting, in the presidential primaries up to this point, it, it's um, Secretary Clinton who has used that issue against Senator Sanders, who of course represented yeah. a largely rural state. And I think that's part of what we have here, is we have Republicans and Democrats from more rural areas who have a, a, a more traditional view it's not that they're completely against uh, gun safety issues, but, it, it, but it's very different than people who live in urban areas where actually most of Americans live these days. Mary, an, inter an interesting thing about public opinion polls at the national level over time is that gradually the gun rights advocates have actually gained substantially when you ask the very, very simple kind of question, are you more concerned about gun rights or gun control? And now there's actually a majority of Americans who would say protecting the rights of gun owners. It's not a large majority, but that really represents a significant change from the past. But when you ask about specific measures, such as background checks, you know, making sure that people who have criminal records and issues of mental health and are on terrorist list, when you ask those kinds of very specific questions, you find 80 to 90 percent of Americans saying, yes, we should have background checks, including overwhelming majorities of Republicans. So it's an interesting disconnect. There's almost a national consensus on a lot of very specific measures, but when you frame them as gun control, there's much less support there. Yeah. Next question. Good afternoon. Um, we're all talking about, or at least there seems to be a consensus that if we get a president elected, whomever that may be, we're all going to get along with Congress and we're going to have a great time and get something done. Jesse Ventura proved that different in Minnesota a few years back, suggesting that uh, either Trump, Cruz, Bloomberg, or Sanders might be elected. I'd be interested in your comments as to how they may be able to get along with Congress and actually get something done or not get anything done uh, given their outsider status of uh, the tr traditional Washington politician. Do you want to start? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll take a shot at that. You know, it, it's interesting, our last three presidents, three people who were elected president, ran on making Washington work. They ran on other things too, but they ran on that particular thing. And, and all three of them ended up having a very, very hard time in doing that. And I suspect that's for two reasons. One is Americans actually do disagree sharply on a number of important issues. Don't disagree on everything, but they disagree on a number of issues. And it's very difficult to bridge those divides. But secondly, uh, working with Congress, just like working with the legislature here in Ohio, requires a lot of attention. It's really a, a, a business more of, than anything else of personal relationships, um, and I think our last three presidents, perhaps President Clinton a little, was a little more uh, engaged uh, with, uh, with uh, the Congress, but certainly our last two, George W. Bush and President Obama, have had their difficulties at that, at that kind of personal level. Now, it may very well be that a complete outsider, um, a, a Bloomberg or a Trump, would find ways to bridge those differences in terms of, of um, both ideas and in terms of personal relationships. I'm a little bit skeptical of that because these are people who, who may have lots of networking skills, but they've never actually worked in Washington. They've never actually worked through this process, which has its own dynamic. But ultimately, I think leadership of bringing us together has to be finding some, con some c consensus solutions to things that we all recognize as problems, but we're up to this point we've been sharply divided. Uh, a couple of, of weeks ago, I had a, a, a journalist come visit my class up at the University of Akron, and one of the students asked this very question. And, and this person's response was, well, we keep asking the same questions, and surprisingly, we get the same answers. <laughs> so maybe on a, a number of these issues, we need to ask some different questions. And, and I think a lot of the attraction of the outsider candidates is that you know, at a sort of intuitive level, people hope that they'll ask a different question. Um, it pains me to say this, but because I, 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 I don't necessarily envision this as a good thing for the country, but uh, it's, it's possible 
that a Trump-type personality could move Congress. Here's the reason I say that. Um, in, uh, Ronald Reagan had a lot of suasion over Democrats in Congress. They agreed with him on little of anything, although he knew how to schmooze. But they felt, given his victory over Carter in 1980, that he had a huge national constituency. It was independent of what the given party label might be. And so they were kind of afraid not to do what he wanted because he had what was seen as a constituency out there of his own. Um, I think that it could be that congressional people would be hesitant to not to at least be seen as hearing Trump out, for example, because he could mobilize all these people. Obviously, the people that you even see in rallies and so forth, they're very, 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 very committed to him emotionally. And that tends to translate into political power sometimes. Uh, I think it could be used in a bad way as well. But I think someone like that might have more oomph than someone seen as inside the tent already. Yeah, I'd be a little bit more skeptical about prospects for success, you know, recognizing the nature of Congress, the divisions within the Congress, uh, where the sanctions and rewards for members of Congress come from. And oftentimes, they come from their constituents uh, representing very safe districts in the House side. So I'd, I'd be a little skeptical. And I'm not sure you know, that Ted Cruz really has the, uh, has the schmoozing abilities. Uh, you know, somebody said before, his fellow senators dislike him. Uh, that's giving him the benefit of the doubt. They despise him. Uh, I was trying to be charitable. It's Ash Wednesday. <laughs> yeah. I, I can see a Donald Trump who you know, is, might be savvy enough to say, OK, I've been elected. Let's see what might be in our mutual political interests mm -hmm. and the national interests, and maybe get something done. I thought the question you're asking is really one that John Kasich has sort of been hinting at in his campaign. And Hillary has certainly been talking about that when she says, well, it's great that Bernie has all these ideas, but you've got to implement things. And you've got to work with people. And I think she was trying to suggest that she probably would be better able to cut a deal with Mitch McConnell or whomever than her opponent. So that's sort of out there. But I think if you have a, uh, it's going to take a 180 on the part of, let's say, a Cruz or a Trump in terms of how they approach governance. And, and one of the things in Ohio, which was very interesting, uh, you would hear, well, in an era when we had strong legislative leadership that did not have term limits, they always complained that a new governor came in and did not respect the legislature. The new governor would always say, I've been elected statewide. I have the mandate or whatever. And, they, and the new governor would have to be reminded that there is a legislative body that can frustrate in that, his ambitions or whatever. Uh, next question. Hi, I'm Carol McGuire. Uh, we we're told at our family gatherings not to discuss religion and politics, but that's precisely what I'm going to ask you to discuss, especially since we have Dr. Green, who is an expert in both areas. Um, as we begin to enter and, and go toward the um, South Carolina Bible Belt primary, um, could you comment a little bit on the role of religion and how it is playing out in these political races? Uh, certainly. Well, religion's a very important part of American politics. Um, it, it always has been uh, from the beginning of the republic. Sometimes it's more evident than other times. We're in a period where it's very evident, particularly on the Republican side, because there are uh, conservative religious folks that can be mobilized uh, by different candidates. We saw in Iowa that Ted Cruz was very successful because he was able to mobilize the evangelical network among pastors and uh, activists in Iowa and helped turn out the vote in that critical caucus. South Carolina is a very conservative state. It's a state with lots and lots of evangelicals. But the evangelical community in South Carolina is not monolithic. And this is probably true of all social groups. The bigger they get, the more you see other kinds of diversities uh, within them. And there certainly are uh, very conservative evangelicals to whom Ted Cruz is you know, the answer to their prayers. But there are other, um, we sometimes call them more moderate, except in Ohio we wouldn't maybe recognize them as moderate. We might say less conservative. Uh, evangelicals in South Carolina who are skeptical of someone like Senator Cruz might feel more comfortable with other uh, kinds of candidates. But I think on the Republican side, there'll be a strong 
competition for that vote. And, but one thing to remember about South Carolina primary, historically, is it has tended to favor establishment candidates, which is interesting. If you think back just as one example, in 1988, Pat Robertson went to South Carolina figuring that he'd win a big victory, and George H.W. Bush defeated him handily uh, in that primary. Um, so, it's a, so it's an interesting state. It's a state that has, while, while right of center, definitely, it has um, a lot of, of, of internal diversity. But religion will matter on the Democratic side as well. One of the really important parts of the Democratic coalition in South Carolina is the African American vote. And the African American churches are like the precincts in that community in South Carolina. And I think there'll be quite a struggle between Secretary Clinton and Senator Sanders for the support of those activists and those church leaders. I think the conventional wisdom right now, which is sometimes right, believe it or not, is that uh, Secretary Clinton has an advantage with that community because of the long relationship that she and her husband have had with the African American community. But many of those pastors and many of their parishioners are quite progressive when it comes to political values. And so there's certainly a possibility that, that Senator Sanders may be able to make some inroads in that community. So I see religion playing out in, in both sides in South Carolina and, and then in other states across the country as well. I, th I think it's been very interesting how our own governor has really linked a number of his policy initiatives to his spiritual and religious values mm -hmm. and does it in a way in which he's not being judgmental of others, but he's giving you insight into what moves him. And in fact, last night's comments uh, after his second place finish were actually, some reporters described it as spiritual, as really talking about his values. And you, do, you know that his values emerge from his Christian beliefs, but he talks about that in ways that are much more encompassing and inclusive than the way some other candidates might talk, which suggests that, you know, I'm good and the rest of you are sinners or whatever. So, uh, but anyway, uh, I can't, is another another question? I'm Carol Looper, and I have a question about divorce. Years ago, I remember Adlai Stevenson was divorced, and it became a huge, as they say, issue. Many of the current candidates are on second or third marriages. Has the American public grown, uh, perhaps, to ignore that particular issue in their candidates for president. I know Ronald Reagan was divorced and remarried, but of course that was a, he was a star, so that may have made a difference. He was from Hollywood. I think, let, me, let me start with one answer as it relates to Donald Trump. Whatever the rules are, it looks like they don't apply to Donald. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so therefore, he probably uh, is not the person to look at here uh, I don't think divorce is, is a, a, a big deal anymore, but if you have a candidate who really is running as the candidate of family values, and you have in that candidate's history not simply a divorce, but a messy divorce involving a number of really inappropriate behaviors or whatever, then that'll, that'll come out and it may not come out but from his opponents, uh, the actual candidates, but there'll be now super PAC ads saying hypocrite and, so that, and, and uh, immoral and all of that. So, but I think the general question you're asking, no, divorce is simply another part of somebody's bio these days. Yes. Thank you, I'm Jane Scott. Um, has there ever been precedent for, um, say, a coalition, for instance, if the the rest of the GOP that got the 45% against the Donald can't stand him. Would the GOP ever broker a pre-convention pre deal to say, okay, you know, uh, there could be potential for a, a, a Kasich Christie ticket or a Kasich Rubio ticket or a Bush Kasich ticket to get this move beyond um, the, the Trumpness of this whole thing. Those conversations are actually ongoing, but not quite at as high a level as you're suggesting. And every time you start talking about that, you run the risk of those conversations becoming 
prematurely public and backfiring against the people who, in fact, want that to happen. One other comment I'd make, uh, I think the media and reporting on the exit polling, you know, are saying, well, you have, you have Trump and you had all these moderates, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I call some of these other people moderates, but they're the mainstream conservatives. They're all assuming that, you know, that Rubio supporters, if Rubio weren't there, that some of them wouldn't vote for Trump. Of course some of them would vote for Trump. And some of Kasich's supporters would vote for Trump. So they're making it such a dichotomy. You have the Trump people, and then anybody who's in this other grouping is automatically anti-Trump. One of the challenges for Donald Trump right now is can he gradually grow his acceptability among Republican participants? Because he, there's still a lot of people who don't like him, but the assumption that anybody who's not part of his coalition now is automatically an opponent, I think that's incorrect. It's extremely difficult, the way we set up our political parties in our election, to have fusion candidacies where you draw people from different political parties. And I wouldn't see that. The, the chances of that happening this time it would be very, very small, even though there certainly would be some people who would like that. Remember, when John McCain um, was nominated, he actually seriously considered Joe Lieberman, Democrat from mm -hmm. Connecticut, to be his vice presidential candidate. And um, many of his advisors said, you know, the party will never stand for it. And one could imagine a very similar response for a Democratic nominee who wanted to pick, you know, a, a well-regarded Republican. Do we have... Fascinating discussion. Um, uh, we encourage you to continue the conversation in the lobby with coffee and cookies. Sometimes the cookies are even warm when you go out there. Um, <clears throat> you can view and share today's forum and all of our forums on CTV Columbus Television, on WOSU and PBS affiliates statewide through the Ohio Channel, and any time on CMC's website via YouTube. So would you help me thank our sponsors, Hannah News Service and Ohio Farm Bureau Federation. as well as our great speakers, Thomas Suttis, John Green, and Herb Asher. And thanks to all of you for being here today. We see you, we'll look forward to seeing you soon.